17. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only 17 Patreon members away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you all get to help keep the show alive and well. All Patreon members will receive 20% off their orders to shallow water fishing tackle, 5% off all their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off to Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll gain access to our members only private Facebook group, members only content, and of course, our weekly and monthly giveaways. Again, we are only 17 members, 17 members away from hitting another major milestone. Thank you all so much. If it wasn't for you, this channel couldn't keep going. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome here to a special Thursday night from Jake's Bait and Tackle Live. Uh, before I start uh, really yapping my gums and introducing everybody, can we get an audio check from everybody at home right now? We got about 20 people watching, I think. I cannot see really that number right there. I'm basically blind. Um, but we are really going to have a fantastic show with some really, really good guests. Just give me, give me nice. Uh, nice to see Doc is back. Uh, yeah, just anyone in the comment section, just let us know how the audio is before we get started here, if I have to make any adjustments. If it's a little low, I'm sorry, we'll have to deal with that. But as long as you can understand the wordage, that's fine, because this thing will be re-uploaded where I have more control over like polishing up the audio. We got Brian Peeler says, sounds good on Facebook. Good. We get somebody from YouTube. I know we got a bunch of people watching from the old YouTube right now. How's that looking? We got about three people there. It's all good. Okay, well, Facebook. Oh, that's good enough, I guess. We got some, we got Facebook's working, then that's fine here. All right, we are here. Uh, my wife just said on YouTube, you're clear. That is awesome. Praise Jesus. So I know there's two ma massive kayak tournaments going on. When we planned this six months ago, we did not think that through about doing this the eve of a major tournament. So this will be some good content, definitely. And you guys don't want to hear me yap at all. But uh, let's get on to these guys here. With It's first, the man, the myth, the legend. They just call him the doc. Hmm. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad the audience is uh, tuning in here. I think we're going to have a fantastic show. I'm uh, glad that uh, that uh, we're back here at Jake's uh, tonight. Fishing the DMV is back at Jake's uh, for uh, what I feel is going to be a great show. Uh, we'll be talking about crankbaits uh, tonight. Uh, I'm by no means a crankbait expert, but we have two gentlemen here uh, with us as guests who are... Uh, what I would consider experts at crankbait fishing. Uh, I just want to basically just tell you that from a standpoint of fishing crankbaits, it's a, it can be very complex or it can be very simple. Uh, in reference to the complexity of it, you know, at this time of year, you're looking at uh, baits that, uh, you know, depending on where you're fishing, whether you're in a Highland Reservoir, Tennessee River ledge fishing or whatever, you may be throwing large baits, uh, baits that are uh, diving 20, 20 feet maybe, or you know, 16 to 20 feet. Uh, big baits taking big heavy rods to throw. For example, this here Azuma. Uh, that's his Shenandoah special. Yeah, it's a Shenandoah special. <laughs> Az Azuma uh, Z Boss 25 there. That'd be something that you'd be see throwing on the ledges and stuff like that in the in the big rivers. Uh, or a uh, 10XD, uh, which would also be running down 18 or so foot. So, uh, and then you go, those would be considered your long plane deep divers, which would be something like your uh, 6XD. Um, from Strike King or some of these other uh, Rapala DT-16s, etc. And then you go into your uh, medium diving baits, uh, which is a whole armory, uh, armatorium of those. Uh, and then all the way down to your shallow deep running baits, uh, into your lipless baits, into your uh, BFS baits, and so it, it just goes on and on and uh but i think you know if it so that shows you how complex this could be 
If you really look at the simplicity of it, you could probably take two of these baits and fish. And that would be something with maybe one deep diving bait, like a, a XD, you know, a, a six, a 6XD and a... Uh, I, I would like to answer this question because I love this. Uh, square bill. We got Everett here. What's everyone's favorite prank bait? I bet you get to the movie and you ask immediately, how is it going to end? We will promise we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> so with... with with that said, I'd like to introduce the, the guys that are actually experts at fishing these baits, and that is the, the Jeff Wolford and Jeff Miller, both who have just come off of great fishing trips up north fishing crankbaits and with great catches. So I'll turn, turn it over to them, and once again, thank everyone for chiming in tonight. All right, you go first. Hey, I'm uh, Jeff Miller, and uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I love throwing crankbaits. I mean, you take a you know, I starting late winter, you know, 40 degrees is about when I start throwing them. And um, you can start, you know, as long as you've thrown something that's six to eight foot and maybe even 10 foot. But um, they're just, like I say, you can cover a lot of water with them. And, um, and if the fish are, you know, if they're really active, they'll really jump on the crankbait. I mean, it's just a, something that you got to have a lot of confidence you know we've probably said that for any of us if you don't have confidence in what you're throwing there's no sense even throwing mm -hmm. so but that's what you know pretty much the way i look at it so yeah me for me for crankbaits um i'll start throwing a crankbait that water temperature hits 37 38 degrees which is you know you said 40. i'll start a little bit lower than that um and Everybody knows I'm a late tackle guy for the most part. I'll start throwing a crankbait, uh, like say 37, 38 degree water temperature, you know, on local waters. And a lot of times I'm throwing that crankbait on six pound line. Um, so, so my kind of motto on that in that cold water, I, I like to get it down and then slow it down because, you know, you're in 38 degree water, you know, they're not as apt to, you know, be chasing um as abruptly as you know you would up there at 45 50 degree water um my biggest smallmouth to date on the shenandoah came uh on a on a cold february day water temperature was 38 degrees uh doc was with me doc actually netted the fish and jeff actually weighed the fish uh, that day i had one bite all day um and it was i think six six five smallmouth on a on a crankbait uh on six pound line mm. and uh you know, I'll take that that one good bite over twenty small oh, bites yeah. any any given day. Um, as far as you know, some of the crankbaits that I throw on local waters, um, it, it really depends on whether I think they're on a on a crawfish bite or whether they're on a you know a bait fish bite. Um, well, and and before we give away the the whole big meat of of today, uh, and then yeah, we'll definitely be showing that picture off about crankbaits. One thing that actually comes up a lot is about this stupid thing here and i actually had a conversation with jake harshman and jeff little the other day about like how it feels like everybody's throwing this chatterbait now and with that said do you feel like this has replaced a lot of the uses for crankbaits and and that's a good thing for a crankbait angler because there's not as many people throwing crankbaits because of this stupid thing what is everyone's thoughts my personal opinion i think that has replaced um spinnerbait bite really for, interesting yeah, okay for a lot of folks yeah, because right. of flash. Yeah, and it's a I mean, for me it's a it's a smaller, tighter profile bait as opposed to the spinner bait. Um I know you have Doc has a lot of confidence yeah, in, I, in the chatter I love bait. The, the, the bladed Jack jig Hammer. bait. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. however I think people that really really know how to uh, use a crankbait and are really good at it, it's I don't think I don't think it ever goes away. I mean, as as Jeff as yeah. Jeff will tell you there, it's uh uh, it's amazing. Uh, you get someone that really loves fishing a crankbait, and you can get right in there beside them, and it's amazing how they they'll, they'll sit there and catch three or four fish to your one. And it's just uh, I think I think the big thing we talked about earlier is you got to have the confidence in in, in using that bait. And uh, I, I love throwing a crankbait. I'm just I just something I got to put more time doing uh, as far as uh, getting that confidence built up. Whereas like the, the jackhammers and uh, 
things like that. I love throwing them. I got confidence in it pretty much any time, any, you know, year round. Yep. So I don't mind, uh, you know, I can throw it, throw it any time. But, no, I don't think that it necessarily replaces the crankbait. But I think, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's just one of the, another one of your another tool, yeah. Yeah, another tool that's that'll mm -hmm. put fish in the boat for sure. Yeah, I feel like in the tournament world, it's just weird because you just see like the crankbait not get it the same spotlight with BSS and certain tournament organizations, and this and swim baits and, and spinner baits really have taken the limelight, which is a shame because. I'm a crankbait addict. Everyone knows that I've thrown this three times my whole life. That's about it. And I have about a hundred dollars worth of them that I never use, but these things absolutely get worn out. Um, this is from two days ago on the Shenandoah. This one's scuffed up. I got one that I was fishing today, pre preparing for. This one has just gone to hell and back. I mean, absolutely the paint wore off of it. I love throwing crankbaits. Um, this is going to be a really good conversation. Jared, what do you think about crankbaits? Thank you, Jared. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Thomas, I think one of the things that, that uh, makes it difficult, especially if someone just getting started, is, like I said, I guess you could make it simple and say, I'm going to carry two or three different type crankbaits, but the, the complexity, the com the, to me, the complexity is there's so many different kinds. I mean, you know, what do you use a, you know, do you use a, a bait that's got a square bill? Do you use a rounded bill? Uh, you know, what size you use, what color you, you choose to use. I mean, of course, I know a lot of that's dependent on where you're fishing, but, you know, for someone that really does not do a lot of crankbait fishing, I mean, you come walk in the tackle store here, mm -hmm. and, you know, you can kind of go, where do you well, start? Where do you start? Right. You know, where do you start with this? And that's kind of why I laid all these out here, saying, you know, depending on where you're fishing, you're fishing uh, a lake, or you're fishing a river, or wherever, you know. So I think I think that kind of intimidates a lot of folks and, and that really does not fish crankbaits a lot. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat intimidated. I mean, I look at it and I say, boy, that's pretty. It looks, looks good. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm the fish. I'm the one that bites. You know, so I buy the lure. Um, and it's hard because of where we live, too, because, I mean, you just pulled out a thing that looks like a 50 cal, and it's like, what lakes around here? Now you travel the country yeah. to places that specifically like those bigger, you know, 20 plus divers are very needed. Yeah. Like I, I kid, like there's just the Shenandoah river. That's a little bit of an overkill, the title Potomac. Like I have three boxes of square bills because most of the places around here, this is fine. Um, and, but then again, if you're in a part of a country, maybe that's all you use and you barely use a square bill. So yeah, it is very specific to the waterways that you got to make sure everything is kind of fine tuned. Well, I, th I think, you know, if you really had to just look at it, I think probably the square bill is the most, you know, is, is the one that, that's, uh, you know, proven mm -hmm. yeah. time and time again. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a bait that you can, you know, really throw into cover. It's a bait that, especially around this area, I mean, you know, you can use the bait. It's, uh, you can throw it into the cover. It, it works. I mean, you know, yeah. y'all are proof of that. Mm -hmm. And then as always, guys, in the comment section, best question of the night will win gift cards to all these lovely sponsors. Uh, you'll get one to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Again, best questions will get it. And then we'll have a bonus one. The best question of the night will win a bonus prize. Uh, Jenny didn't sign off on this, but she'll be happy anyway. You'll win a $15 gift card if it's the best question of the night. And we'll have the panel has to decide at the end what that best question would be. So let's get some good dialogue going because this is a really, really cool treat with, with these guys here. Um, yeah, I mean, how do you want to start? You want to start with uh, just going this way and just do lakes first and then come back to talking about like smallmouth rivers kind of deal like how do we want to like break this down who's yeah, fished a yeah, lake first the, recently yeah. well I, I can just give you some of my experience which is not not a whole lot but i can tell you fishing like tennessee river which is i'm from tennessee originally fishing down uh some of the lake chains on the tennessee river pickwick some of those places where you ledge fishing is is big uh you know, like I said, those those large baits at, at, going into the summertime of year, those those are part of your arsenal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, you you moving moving out out out. Yeah, and the other these other baits work too. But I'm just talking about you know if you're trying to get on a 20 foot down on a ledge at a at fish you're seeing down there, sometimes you have to use the big baits. Uh, but now I think you know you, if you move from there. Uh, like I said, you go into the, the, the medium divers, uh, which depending on the depth of water, you know, you're fishing, you're trying to get down 10, 10, 12 foot. Uh, you, you have to kind of, you know, you, you, you've got bait, you can choose from there. Now I think you decide, you know, are you using a bait that's got a, a larger bill that 
uh, more rounded bill that it's got more action versus something that's a little more mm -hmm. subtle. Uh, you just have to uh, make that decision based on time of year. For example, you're fishing in the winter, you might choose something here like the uh, River to Seas. There's a, it's a, basically a crank, it's a crank, uh, this one here happens to be a crank 75. Uh, this is an outstanding, this is, this is actually an outstanding crankbait to use in, in the winter uh, because it's got a very subtle action, but it gets deep. And uh, so, you know, you might choose something like that to use. Uh, how do you pick the one that you want to throw first and then uh, you know what let me ask my second question first first question what is your setup to throw that spade <laughs> that thing is mad could you bring that one up to the camera again and yeah show the little one too like for like both of them because yeah, this, this one right here this yeah that would be better like this is like an s like a uh, 3x I mean, you know you between large mouth and small mouth, I mean yeah, that's, right. that yeah. big one, and then pull them both up together just to kind of show yeah. like the the that's yeah, <laughs> it's massive. Um, oh, it was, that's got to work you out. Too. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, that's that yeah, right. Like you're worn out after throwing like that off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's going to wear you out. Yeah, but uh, you know, you're going to use something like well, I think particularly the rod I, I use on that. It's a, it's an X Pride. It's a it's a heavy. It's a mm -hmm. seven six. You know, with a large spool lose real and 17 pound test line you know i mean that's what uh so you know like i said that's uh it, it, and it's a workout and that's not something you know you, you're not going to use this you know no. it's not something you're going to use every, it's going to be mm -hmm. kind of fish specific yeah uh, and i think that's really what chimed into what david frist did with having that really really noodle of a, of a rod and that really slow gear ratio is because when you're dealing with a bait that size you want that thing to be able to load otherwise you're just getting worked out if you mm -hmm. used a flipping stick with that that shovel like it would just completely wear you out the whole time um and so but i think that's interesting with that mindset because again i've said this on my show way too many times about like how if you just read bass you would think that's what you're supposed to do all the time whether it's shad or crankbait you need to pull noodle of a rod but with some of my setups there that's not always the case you know i'd use a little bit heavier rod depending that's not the standard because of certain situations but i never use this heavier stuff on a you know a 30 xd because you would just be sweating buckets doing it mm -hmm. for sure color wise mm -hmm. what are you going to use at that depth generally speaking do you keep it as do you keep it super simple or do you get kind of complicated with it no i mean i, I think basically try to keep it simple i mean you know you're gonna you have a, I use a couple of different colors i'll use the uh the blue back with the chartreuse and then something depending on the water clarity you know if you if the water happens to be clear where you're fishing you might use a more natural uh type bait uh uh, if the water's dirty, you might go. You know, you go with the the blue. Mm -hmm. uh, something chartreuse. like a sex, something like a sexy shad. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. sexy shad. Yeah, you know, it depends on try what. Try to match you know. the hatch type right. deal. Uh, but basically, you know, that's very limited fishing. Uh, day in and day out, you know, you. If I'm using crankbait, I'm using some of these smaller yeah. baits. I'm using, uh, you know, it depends on how what depth I'm wanting to go. If I'm wanting to go, you know, eight or nine foot, I I'll, I'll be using maybe something like a spro. 50 or 55 uh which you know like when we go north i know that's a, that's a big bait right there when we use crankbaits up north uh that seems to be a an excellent bait and we got we got uh let's see we got a ton of questions i want to make sure we're going to get into a couple of these questions right now because it's kind of topical to the the thing that we're talking about right now let's go with scott uh scott bowers uh dinner played on the front of that 10 xd a hundred percent dude uh let's see oh here's a good one from uh scott again who is who still prefers balsa baits does anyone use balsa baits still I don't. I don't you know i think i mean i think balsa baits are good but i think now with the plastics as good yeah. as they are that you're probably you know you don't really have to use the balsa uh, i tell you what if you really want to get into balsa baits you go, go to knoxville tennessee they have a show down there once a year and it's nothing but home uh, local homemade bosses and they it's a show to see and um they'll have uh you know, some of the locals there that's that's a big area for fishing you jeff you know did i yeah that's a big area for fishing balsa baits uh, a lot of people there make them yep and here's a this is a bagley killer bee i don't think they make this one anymore but that's a balsa and the one nice thing about the balsa for people that are not balsa is we're going to be committing <laughs> uh, okay there we go because <laughs> 
we got it never flinches um it's just the the wobble on it is really really awesome it's yeah. not as tight uh it i don't I, that's the biggest thing and i think it's also the vibration and the sound of that thing is a little bit different than plastic and i wonder how much more that plays nowadays when everyone's throwing plastic is if it's just because the sound is so different and unique and is your finger okay yeah. <laughs> uh let's see well too you know i think thomas you, it brings up a good point about your sound i mean there's times when you know do you really want a lot of sound yeah. or do you want silence i mean you know if you're casting fish if you're in clear water or something and you're casting well beyond the fish and trying to bring back through there they're hearing this noise all the way across you know they may just ignore it mm -hmm. whereas if you're bringing something silent through there and then suddenly it appears in front of them in front of them, mm -hmm. boom. and you get that reaction you get that reaction bait. Yeah. Yeah. So i think that brings up a good point as to mm -hmm. you know you're in muddy water it's or something like that or more dingy water mm -hmm. and yeah you, know, you just gotta let the fish tell you what you what they want and yeah, i, I mean, think when they're on the crayfish too the clicking i mean yeah. you know with the crawfish when they back up they they're doing a little clicking sound mm -hmm. and um to me that it's and then you, you know, get the time of year do you want to do you want to you really want a lot of a wobble you know a lot of a lot of action or do you want more subtle action obviously yeah. going into like the winter yeah. Uh, cooler much you know you might use flat side you want you want less action whereas when things are wide open you get a wiggle wart you know wiggle mm -hmm. wart. This, that, that thing probably has the best action or most action real. of anything mm -hmm. is a wiggle wart. you wonder is it is just because like baits catch fishermen not the fish where i like somebody wins a big <laughs> tournament and then all of a sudden we get like slim sided crankbaits for the next four years um you see this with like the glide baits too and the um the mega bass, the, the mag draft, where somebody wins on that, and then all of a sudden, that's all we're that's getting everybody. for these two years. Yep. Because I heard of those, but until like Ot Defoe and whoever the other guy was did well, and then every company came out with one, I, I rarely saw them. I knew of them, but they weren't as prolific as they are now. Fascinating, interesting stuff. So uh, we do have a couple of, let's see, we've got a couple questions here. I want to make sure we, we keep going here. Let me scroll right here. Whoa, wrong way. There we go. Cool. Oh my goodness. The quote, we are going to be, Sorry. we're going to be here for a while. And we got bass and beer radio. Hey fellas. Hey boss. How you doing? Hope and we got a uh, Katie here. Katie, uh, you just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle Jared. You want to, what does that say? Like you all prefer water that is hard fishing, but produces large fish or easier fishing water with more average fish. And why? Who wants to go first? Katie oh it's katie hey katie um me personally i'll take the hard fishing water that's going to produce better quality fish but you know a good chance less of those yeah like uh i'll take that slow great bite over a lot of bites and this medium size you know fish you know this 12 and 13 inch fish as opposed to two pound three pound fish are up Go. We have so many questions. Let's. We're gonna get through. We're probably gonna have just an hour of Q and A. So we're gonna wait on that. That was a bad mistake. I think we're gonna integrate that. Let's just keep going here. And we'll get back to the comment section. Uh, Jeff, what are your favorite baits? What do you got there? Uh, some of my favorite baits, and this is primarily for local waters. Um, Cotton Cordell. This particular <sighs> cool one. Now, color. Is that plastic or balsa? That's plastic. plastic. Yeah. yeah. Hey guys. I find that to be a really good bait on pretty much all the local rivers. So um, Katie also wants to know, hi, I live in Montana. Can we pawn the gift card off someone else? Well, it, funny you mentioned that. Jake's Bait and Tackle does offer online and delivery. Uh, Jenny will also autograph and sign anything you get as well. But if you would like it. There you go. So Katie, if you still want it, you can get some apparel here, some Jake's. We like to keep Jake's uh, all over the corners of the earth. We got uh thanks Jeff, miss fishing with you. Come. To, what is Montana fishing like? Have y'all been out to Montana? She turned Is it trout yeah. fishing or is there bass in Montana too? I think there is bass. She, she does a lot of trout fishing too. That's probably a beautiful country, honestly. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, as I derail us. Anyway, back to the back to the crankbaits. Um, and then um, Bandit, uh, Bandit 200 series. Um, oh, one of my one of my go-to colors by far is the uh, root beer. 
you can get this with the white belly or you can get it with a chartreuse belly either or depending on the water clarity and you know fish will tell you which one they want And also, I like throwing, um, I've got pretty good faith in some of these. Um, they're more like a custom, custom colors, um, custom paint jobs by, you know, a variety of local people. Some not real local, but they definitely, uh, you can give them a pattern. I'm going to throw those, might sticky again. You can give them a pattern and, you know, get in contact with them and have them hopefully duplicate you can see that's a that's a good that's color a, there that's a cool money color. A money right there yep it's hard some of these 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 local painters because it's like it's almost art you don't oh, want to yeah, eat that into a dock after they spent three days painting it and that that bad boy right there up anywhere up north yeah that's that's got money right Is all that a over or a rock crawler no, that's that's a custom that's, that's a custom yeah yep. that's a custom it looks almost like an old school storm wiggle wart with the eyes, yep. that's crazy. And then, of course, um, some of your spro, um, you know, your 50s, 55, depending on the depth of the water. Spro, I mean, you know, and they're priced pretty good. They're hard to beat. They really are. Yep. They, uh, quite a variety of colors and patterns, and they uh, they seem to run pretty true. What's your yeah. setup for crankbait fishing? Uh, if I'm throwing a spinning rod... I'm usually throwing six pound line, believe it or not. Um, a bait caster, I'm throwing ten. Wow, yep, that's yeah. insane. Now, Jeff, he yeah, he's bait caster a thousand percent. Um, I'll throw it on a bait caster also. Um, if I'm fishing a river bank where I'm getting a lot of overhanging branches and I'm looking for shade pockets, like you know, as the yeah. water temperature starts warming up, then I'm going to take that that ducket spinning rod mm -hmm. with six pound line. And that crankbait's going right back under them limbs, you know. Or if the wind's blowing hard and I'm trying to present a, a light crankbait, it's going on a spinning rod. Yeah, yeah and, and we I've mentioned that on the show too, because like my title Potomac setup is a spinning rod. But I for the grass and stuff, I know that was a question that we'll get to it, but I throw straight braid on a spinning rod because you're never gonna bird's nest and you can you can cast into the wind so good compared to a bait caster. Mm -hmm. But people don't do it. It's really weird. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm one of them. Yeah. I mean, I'm. I mean, I do. I throw ten pound test on a bait caster, probably you no know, no less than a seven foot rod, and I'm up to seven foot eleven. Wow, uh, really? You know, yeah. I mean, the seven foot eleven, I'm like it's cashing rod, and then it's just I can get the distance on it. You know, getting back to square bills, you know. Well, or just say at 40 degree water, you, I, I like that seven foot 11 because I can, you know, put a lot of distance. I mean, yeah, it makes it tough in the wind, but you kind of, you kind of got to get the wind behind you. Maybe sometimes face your boat a different mm -hmm. direction or whatever, yeah. but I'll get it down, especially when the water's cold, you got to get it down to bottom and then I'll just slow it down and you know, barely ticking the rod and you want that thing just kind of ticking the bottom and sometimes it, you know you'll feel them hit it but most time you'll just feel a rod load up and you they've already hooked herself i mean they pretty much done come up there and they've just locked down on yep. it and you just steady cranking and your rod will just like yeah. i said load up and it'll load you know it's most time mm -hmm. it's a good small mouth it's no doubt about it but, what are you casting all right this is a question to everyone when you're fishing river small are you casting up current or are you casting perpendicular like what angles do you usually use um I mostly cast up, up river, and um, bring it down because I, you know, I think the fish are always facing the current, and when it comes, you it's know, a natural, uh, yeah, it's, it's more of a natural, natural presentation. Presentation, exactly. You know, they're just laying there, and you know, a lot of times when the water's dirty, they, to me, when they, they don't get a chance to look at it when the water's clear. When the water's clear, they get a, to me, they get too much of a chance to look at it. Yeah, but when it's dirty. They just see that little bit of yeah, flash, a, and they yeah, and it's a bigger bait. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, they yeah, they whereas, like, if, whereas if you're out here on the lake, say out Lake Holiday or Lake Frederick, yeah. you know, it really don't matter. I mean, you up or down, I mean, front or back, and you're just getting a different angle. Mm -hmm. You know, as you cover yeah. the water, it's not that big of a deal. 
but and sometimes presentation really makes sometimes like like on lakes especially um you know if, if you know there's some fish there uh, you know if you're live scoping them or whatever um just a different uh angle from your presentation I mean, it, you can throw you can throw from one angle and not get bit and spin the boat around and bring it in from a different yeah, angle, yep. whether it's a, a drop off or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is, a rock pile and get bit, you know, two out of three casts. And then going yeah. back to what Jeff was saying, throwing like a 7-Eleven rod, what I find myself doing, um, if I'm throwing, you know, like a 6-8, a like one of the, the ducket rods, I'll catch myself to get that extra two feet. If I'm not maintaining bottom contact, that rod tip's going mm -hmm. in the water. Yeah, almost down it's to the reel. It's definitely going down into the water till I can get down to that extra two feet, three feet that I need, you know, for that crankbait to yeah. tick off the bottom. Cause, and, and that's something I'm, I'm so glad we we're able to like go through everybody's setup here is because like I want to get into mine because I fished from a boat pretty much until like last year when I started to fish a little bit more kayak tournaments. And I realized you have to adjust your setups to where you are because my number one crankbait setup always was it was a zillion Daiwa reel. It was a 4.9. I'd throw 12 pound fluorocarbon on a 712 Kevin Van Dam crank and stick. This thing, you could just launch a crankbait. And if it's those longer bills, like you're working lakes, it doesn't work you hard. You could count rocks. It really would really load up good. And that's why I really used a lot for my crankbait situations on lakes. And I would adjust the reel if I want a little bit more speed and a little bit more control of that. But then what I found out with that super limber setup is when you go to a kayak and you load up on them, I was missing fish all the time. I didn't know what the hell was going on. In a kayak, you can't take a step back. You can't lock. You're basically here. Yeah. And I realized real quick that I had to take and create a separate setup for my kayaking, which was a lot heavier and a lot more no stretch and a faster raw or a faster reel setup because I had to make up that line with just my hand. I can't take a step back. I can't lean. And probably the kayak's going forward depending on how big the fish is. And so I really realized the importance of adjusting setups. And so what I brought today was not my, my lake stuff, but this is my kayak bait caster here. This is a seven. This is 14 pound fluorocarbon. Um, and this is a, a medium graphite rod versus a, a like a more of a glass rod I'd use on a lake. But because I can just I can wind a little bit harder and when I get one, I can catch up to them. And that actually fixed my my missed fish thing. The other thing I have, which I, it's in the truck, is I have a, um, a spinning rod with 12 pound straight braid. I don't think they can see it when you're burning it over their head, especially as a question about grass, they can't see it. And when you make that long cast in a yak, or if you make a super long cast in a boat, I think the longer your cast is, the higher probability you have of catching a fish because they, they don't know you're there. Well, that means as soon as that thing hits the water, you need to be able to get those trebs into them. And if you have a, a noodle rod that just bends over, it's harder to get that treb in them. And if they jump, that's when you're probably going to miss them. So I like to go straight braid and I just really crank down that, that, that reel. And I don't, I don't miss them a lot. The next thing I want to talk to you all about is this is something I'm religious about is hooks. Um, I really fell in love with triple grips. You don't, fish that slash at it you don't always get but as long as they get at least one hook in them you pretty much got them they do not throw them as much and these are a little bit sturdier to where you can actually haul on them and they won't break out i want everyone's opinion do you think treble hooks matter and if they do do you like round bends or do you like these like triple grip styles what are your thoughts i, I probably don't change the hooks out as much as a lot of people do. I, I pretty much, a lot of times just basically go standard, but I probably use the round bends uh, more so than than any other. I don't know that I can tell you exactly why, but I don't know, it just seems to. Works good? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty much, I just generally stick with the round. Why? Yeah. Um, the only, generally the only hooks that I will change out are my top water baits. Hmm pop bars you know things like that i like the uh i believe they're called the uh, true turn or yes. you got the twist yeah yeah yeah. those are really cool yeah i really like those on my my top water baits that's really the only thing i will change out yeah i'm pretty much the same way um yeah, and where, the main where's that one crank 
<laughs> this hook's mm-hmm. on it. <laughs> you see her? Yeah. That one? That thing's wore out. Yeah. That's a Shenandoah River wore out one right there. Oh, that thing's cool. That thing's caught a lot of fish. And it's amazing how the fish can throw a freaking crankbait. You got yeah. six, you know, you got six trebles down there, and 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 you can always tell if the fish are really wanting a crankbait is when they, especially up north. I mean, and even on the Shenandoah, sometimes they will engulf that thing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's down, and I, I, and I hate that when it's down in their throat. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just, yeah, I'd rather miss the fish than have him suck it down in his throat. Because I mean, you got to do a little surgical to get. To get them out. I, I'm glad you said that. A friend of mine turned me on to this. I use this in my boat too. If you're going with smallmouth and you're doing trebs, I highly suggest getting something like this, especially when they get hooked deep, so you yep. can get some separation between your hand and those fish's mouth. Because on a large mouth, I don't care how small or big, they don't care. They're like little Great Danes, they just lay in your lap. A small mouth will figure out a way to kill you. Oh, and yeah. put this into your hand. Yep, mm-hmm. them little 11, 12, oh, 13 oh inchers. There's yeah. no, they're, they're just. You get ones like that. Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> they're eating when they're like That's that. That's when you know they're eating. Yeah. But yeah, so you just be careful with them when you're fishing that. And then I think I already went through mine. Uh, Bandit, I don't know what color this is. It's just, I guess the yellow crawdad. This on the title Potomac is absolute money. I've won a lot of money on that. That's the bait that I finished top 10 with. This is literally, I think you're saying bait Bandit. Not by Bandit, Bandit. but oh, yeah. just a square that right there is a, I'm right telling you, it's a even on too. the Susquehanna, that's yep. a killer bait that, on the Susquehanna. Uh, <coughs> absolute money. Again, it's that chartreuse. Or something. Yeah. This thing too, I don't see a lot of people throwing chartreuse crankbaits anymore, mm. but they work really good. Yeah. And then oh. Strike King mm. quit making a lot of their baits for some reason. I don't know what color this is, but it stopped being made. It's almost like a, uh, I don't know, a brown a brown crayfish i think i don't know but that's a really cool color if you can find it on ebay yeah that chartreuse black black back is, oh dude uh, i mean that's money uh, on, uh a lot of times yeah i mean that's like i got i bought so many of these when they went out Let me see that. that looks like a 17. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only 17 Patreon members away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you all get to help keep the show alive and well. All Patreon members will receive 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Tackle, 5% off all their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off to Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll gain access to our members-only private Facebook group, members-only content, and of course, our weekly and monthly giveaways. Again, we are only 17 members, 17 members away from hitting another major milestone. Thank you all so much. If it wasn't for you, this channel couldn't keep going. It's almost like the brown crawl mm-hmm. from Strike King. Mm-hmm. It's just a, maybe the brown crawl is just a little bit darker. It's almost got the same color though. It's you got know, the now they've got a lot of the, yeah, uh, the close, BFS yeah. baits. Uh, this here is the, uh, the, the uh, Gaffin from Mega Bass. That's a that's a neat little little finesse bait that. You know, a lot of times when not anything when uh, when nothing else is working, that that's a neat little little rig. There's kind of goes along with the Shimano Mac, uh, Macbeth series. These are, like I said, a lot of times these are. The, I guess you'd consider them BFS type baits, but they were yeah. great, man. Spinning Scott rod. Bowers, uh, fish need a tetanus shot after the, uh, getting that hook. No, yeah, I agree with that. All right, so now we're going to be getting into. Uh, we got so many questions. We're going to be. We probably should get into some of these. Uh, we got S S R R. Can we get away from the tournament fishing thing? It seems like all I hear about here anymore is B S about what some tournament boy is doing. We need some more of the rest of us. Well, that's why this show is here because we're trying to balance it out a lot more to make sure everyone has uh, something that they can actually enjoy. We got Chris Sherwood, uh, who's playing. What? Vanna who's White. Playing, Vanna who's White. playing Vanna White? Uh, love that you can get a close up for the crankbaits. Yeah, that, just huge shout out to Jared's hand for for doing that for us. We got this. Uh, 
uh, we got the double stamp baby one. Yeah, baby one minus. That's I did not bring my title Potomac box, but yeah, baby ones yep. are definitely a, a thing. Uh, ooh, here we go. There's a great one. All right, Ray, you just won a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Uh, which part slash section on each of these rivers has the best chance of a seven pound plus smallie? On number one, the Shenandoah, two, Potomac, three, Susquehanna. All guest opinions, please. Yeah, I'm going to say the Shenandoah. Hands down. I mean, well, it's. Which section on the Shenandoah? I'm going to say the South Fork of the Shenandoah. Yep. We got two for that. Okay. Well, I know, I know my biggest fish from the Shenandoah has been out of South Fork. Yeah. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's 512, but that's the biggest one I've caught in the Shenandoah, but yep. it was out of the South Fork. Yeah. I uh, caught one back in February <laughs> of this year, February 15th. Me and Floyd Wharton was fishing. I caught a 6'8. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow. You know, it's a and, hell of a fish. But I caught that on two, but it's. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say. So if I get this question, if I understand this question, so for all three parts, I think the the Susquehanna Reservoir, What uh, we just had the Bass and Beer guys. If you're on, please give me the name of that reservoir on the Susquehanna River. Um, Which section please. of Susquehanna would you think? Yeah, it's it's near the dam. Uh, Conowingo, Lake Conowingo. Conowingo. I think Lake Conowingo has a monster in it that people can't catch uh, just because of the way that thing is shaped and everything, and no one fishes it. So I think there's a seven pounder in Conowingo. Yeah, I mean, when I'm like, fishing the Susquehanna, I'm I'm above Harrisburg mm -hmm. from there yeah. up to um, I don't know is Liverpool. Is, is there a seven pounder in that section? You think because Susky's got a lot of fives. There's but, a lot of fives. Um, occasionally you'll get a six, but I've caught my bigger fish on the Shenandoah. Uh, hmm. I have I mean, absolutely. You know, and then uh, for the I'll give you my last po last two parts. So. Shenandoah, I think it'll be the West Virginia portion of the Shenandoah River just because no one fishes it. Like very few people float or fish that area, I think in my opinion, because there's not a lot of boat ramps and there's a license issue because there's also not a lot of guides that do that part because of the license issue. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a seven pounder in there. But the place I think that does have a seven pounder in it right now is Upper Potomac. Hands down, they've been doing a stocking program the last five years from Harper's Ferry down. I think there's a there there has been a six caught out of there last year. So that's one good meal, no, two good meals. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, yeah. even around Brunswick area, I mean, oh, yeah. there's so many five plus. I'm talking high fives, mm -hmm. and you know, just it's a matter of time. A matter of it's time. A matter of time. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and it could be well past a seven pounder, you know. But, yeah, if you don't get into a fish kill section, and, yeah, fingers crossed. You know, there. Right, just let them keep growing. So I think I think we got that one good. That's a really good question, Ryan. Uh, let's see. Let's keep scrolling down. Oh, wrong way. Uh, do, 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 Katie. Okay. Oh wait, what did Katie say? Hey, hi, Montana. Okay, got that one. Online shopping. Thanks. Oh, it right, here we go. What does this one say? Uh, Jenny needs to autograph. I will hold on to it. Buy some hats. There we go. <laughs> Love to hear that. Uh, okay. Oh, here we go. Scott, you just won a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. What crankbaits are you throwing in grass? Minus one. Uh, a minus, minus one. one yeah. yeah. Depends on how much water is over the right. grass. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there here you go. go. Yeah. Do I even have a lipless? Of course, it's a it's a lipless. There's no way I have a lipless in here. Yeah. I think oh my the, God, I have a lipless. Why do I have a lipless? <laughs> obviously, in a I love fishing lipless crankbait and grass. <coughs> and you know, you don't think about fishing the lipless oh, crankbait right. and wood. I'll show you a little trick that I found. I, mean, I, I didn't come up with this, but it, it definitely works. This is taking your lipless crankbait. You want to really, you know, they really hang up in the wood. Right, so <laughs> if you'll take the back hook off and put some bling yep. on there that's and upside your front board. hook, that's a mm -hmm. that's a good rig <laughs> that you can throw that's and neat. cover yeah, a lot better than if you leave, you know, with two trebles on it. So you, obviously it'll still hang up, but it's not near as bad as. Uh, uh, so that's kind of a little little trick there, that, uh, little change, little custom relation that that works good. There's a matter. And Scott, let me get a little bit more inception on that there. It's not necessarily a crankbait, but I think it's your setup. If you are going to be fishing grass, I highly recommend going straight braid. Like I said, like I have a multitude of crankbait setups. I will also throw braid on a six gear ratio bait caster on a medium heavy rod, just because depending on like I'm talking submerged vegetation, it comes up to like two feet because that way you can really pop it out. 
you need a good snap and you're not dragging it. When you're doing fluorocarbon, that limp noodle like rod that you're fishing brush piles with and you pull, it's it's not gonna have that crisp pop. Um, I really believe with these or a lipless or whatever, if this is the stock and that thing hits, you want it to pop free and still be as close to that stock as possible. You don't want it to be a foot and a half over from it. Or what's worse is you pull and you just gloop the whole thing over. That's going to really spook the bass. I really think it's that that shock of it hitting and it pops Double free. And it, yep, and it's right there. So whatever setup you use, you need it, I think, to be as sensitive as possible. So as soon as you feel the grass, you can start popping. If you have it to where it's dull and it buries in there too much and then you pop, it's not going to be as effective. That's just, again, that's just my opinion of how I like to really fish them. Um, let's see. We've got so many questions. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, fish need a tetanus shot for that. We can do that one. Um, storm wiggle warts are great all year round. Isn't the, isn't the uh, rock crawler basically like a wiggle wart, a, a version of that? I feel like that's what they made the rock crawler to be like. I think it's a little different body style. You think so? Yeah. yeah. I think the wart has a wider. Yeah, that's that that wart really yeah, wider it, wobbles. It really goes. I mean, it's got a lot of action. Oh, yeah, it a ton is. Ton of action. Uh, that's what I've found out. Where, what do you all as far as the, the wide hunt versus the, the more of a compact? Wintertime, I want something that's tight. Yeah. I don't want a sweeping. Mm -hmm. You know east to west i want something more north and south that's tight um when it warms up yeah you want something that's going to go more erratic more erratic mm -hmm. right more like wounded or something like mm -hmm. that we got brooke uh brooke denise oh, i got a pole in the way Bro yeah brookie denise doc is my favorite yeah everyone loves doc uh we are going to be selling plushies of him soon by the way you can get them at the front oh, please have him back and more often I, he's Dude, he's always on the road. I mean, he just got back from Canada. I think he's leaving next week. You're going to Tennessee train. I mean, my goodness. Yeah, traveling. Got to catch some fish. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we're in our new studio now and it's not freezing outside. So we're going to try to do this once a month until it gets below freezing. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be back here once a month at least and hopefully doc will be able to join us each time or and anyone who wants to join us we got plenty of mics uh what's this next one uh juniata, see, uh, the, the juniata. uh jeffrey david spencer uh juliata is a solid place to get a five plus absolutely that's a really really cool place i wish the, the walls mm -hmm. up there are wonky though with the spawn aren't they like when you're allowed to actually fish for smallmouth yeah, they yeah, they lifted that. That's okay. probably been I don't know how many years now. Been a while. Seven or eight years yeah. now, I think. Let's see, Brian Peeler, uh, main stem. Yeah, main, main stem doesn't get the same love. Um, I just also think it's just there's parts that I don't know how much pressure it actually gets because the South Fork has just always been just so freaking good. And I think it's also just a testament to like the main stem coming back because I grew up in Loudoun County right over seven, so I fished the main stem a lot growing up, and it sucked sent until three years ago where it just wasn't trash like you go out there and catch a decent one and now you're starting to see some size back which is you know knock on wood that's really really awesome uh let's see do i have okay sorry uh yeah i cannot pronounce that b b callus jr i hope i got that right there we go um how much lipless are you throwing ah uh, the most money I ever won in a tournament was on lipless and i could probably do an hour lecture on lipless baits but to say i do throw it a lot not as much for smallmouth though uh this is the only one that got into my square bill box i don't know why this is a i'm not gonna throw that but anyway it's a one knocker it's uh this is the booyah one knocker this is the stuff that you can buy off of ebay and i think it makes the most difference is buying different ones i have silenced ones that are not made anymore and you can hear with this one that really no, really not. that dull noise yeah. and no two are alike with with these lipless i think this is a bait where the sound is that freaking important whether it's just the little bbs brass bbs like i i could go down a rabbit hole with that but if you like lipless fishing i highly suggest you get a, a quick change clip just so you don't have to have 30 lipless rods and you can quickly flip out your color and your sound and just make little adjustments there. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about the whole lipless thing. Well, I, I, I tend to use lipless, I guess a little earlier in, uh, mm -hmm. more than the, probably the earlier spring maybe. Uh, uh, I tend, 
But I mean, you know, obviously, it's a, as far as I'm concerned, it's all all through the summer bait. But you know, once the fish get up, once you get up around seventy something degrees, you know, suddenly, suddenly you go from these fish being real aggressive. Uh, you know, as, as typically as the water warms, you know, the, the, the fish tend to get more aggressive as with the warming mm -hmm. to a certain point, uh, you know, whether that's 72 or whatever, and then it, they just kind of boom. That's when you find yourself needing to go to a jig or big worm or something like that because they're not really, they're not really looking to be chasing and looking for that reaction, you know, get going after that reaction. Bite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's, when that's you bring always out a hard the top, top water bait. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You get, you get up at two o'clock in the morning on your own, the river at three 30 and you're throwing mm -hmm. a buzz bait till eight o'clock and you're loading the boat up and going home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that yeah. lipless bite, it, it really is one key factor is like, can you fish it? So could I fish it in the summer on the tidal Potomac? I don't think you get it through like some of that grass. I know like on some lakes, like where they have like white bass and striper, you can still throw them out there for them. But it, it really is also like cover dependent because usually it is a grass bite. And if it gets too thick, you really can't use it successfully. And a lot of people have issues with them throwing them, uh, you throwing fish on them. I kind of feel like I figured that out to where you got to get thick hooks and you are not playing them. It's you hook them and it's you're winching because what happens is when they jump, the key is, is to drag them across the surface. I have a medium heavy rod and I have a, I have a winch reel for these and you're just cranking on them because as long as you keep pressure, they can't no, throw it. Can't throw. If you just try to do this where you like lock up like a crankbait and they get to be able to just throw this back and forth like that, a miracle, I didn't hook myself. That's when that actually will happen and, and they'll chuck that. Um, and then another thing is like smallmouth versus largemouth. I will say that like a largemouth won't throw these much as a smallie. A smallie, I've tried these up at like Cayuga. Um, yeah, because they'll hit that that hook and then immediately jump. Whereas I think a largemouth will wallow a little bit more. And I think that makes a big difference because that smallie hitting straight up into the air has a way easier time chucking that thing back at your face. Yeah, and when the water's warmer too, <laughs> those fish just seem uh, to jump kind of right like up. missiles out of the water. Instantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's in, in yeah. reference. I tell you, uh, and on the Susquehanna, this is gold too, and that's uh, storm makes this the the Arashi, Arashi uh, uh, lipless. That is a, a great bait uh, on Susquehanna fishing the ledges, just coming across, kind of yo-yoing it across them ledges. That's that's uh, sometimes that's a that's a killer that's a and it's a great bite if you'll notice the hooks on that just what thomas was talking about the standard hooks on that the rashi is just what you're talking about you don't have to worry about changing them out versus if you look at you know the uh the old standard rattle trap I mean, look the difference in the hooks there i mean mm -hmm. of course that is a little little smaller than a rashi but but if you'll see this uh, that rashi uh lipless has a really a thick hook that's, yeah, and that's important because I mean, if you can even like, you can feel that like, push on this one. Oh yeah, and then you different. can feel how much it flexes. These mm -hmm. are double strength, and I use this with braid, and you can feel like they don't flex out. And so, if you're gonna lean on them harder, and I again, I'm probably on the spectrum when it comes to treble hooks. I think it really makes a difference. If yeah. you are gonna use heavier stuff, oh, yeah. you gotta get double strength hooks to when when you lean, they're not gonna bow out. Aaron Martin like jerkbait hooks that are super soft and sticky that's not a problem on a jerkbait setup because it's going to give to them but if you lock up to them with a heavy gear on a on what I call a really soft treble hook that hook will flex a little bit and when it flexes a little bit like it'll that. pop out yeah, like I that. that one is yep and this was on straight braid and these flexed out because I s did not switch out these are Aaron Martin's uh jerkbait treble hooks and they just bow out on you Yep. And so it's just something to keep in mind that you can throw harder, heavier stuff with these baits, especially these, these, these are grass. This is like what we're talking about here. I don't know if you guys can see it. These are uh, my man's crank baits, my minus ones. And these are the old ones that I haven't switched out the treble hooks. That one I was fishing uh, two weekends ago during a kayak tournament and also the Antietam Bassmasters on a boat tournament. Those are double X, I think they're two times. Yeah, they're two times mm -hmm. yeah. strength uh, Mustang triple grips. Those you can throw on straight braid and winch and they won't bend out. That's needed when you're fishing that grass and those three to four pound largemouth, you hook and winch and you won't lose them. If you just try to hold and let them wallow there, every time they jump, you're going to run the risk of that, of something bad happening. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I think 
I could go down too much of a rabbit hole with with all that stuff. Uh, we got uh, we got Everett again. Let's see. Props to Mr. Jared for his bait presentation skills. Absolutely. Uh, we got uh, Jeffrey. Uh, what brand buzz bait is a must have tied on? Ooh, I I don't throw a lot of buzz bait sadly. I really need to get back into that. The whopper plopper. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> taken over. The whopper plopper yeah. has taken over. I mean. Um, yeah. Booyah with a clacker. Ooh. Yes. Clacker. Yeah. That's it. I make my own buzz. Yeah. I think the buzz bait with the clackers definitely makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think too with the buzz bait, you know, you got to kind of wear them in a little bit. You know, hold them out the window going to the, going to the river. <laughs> Let's, you know, you know, break them in. Break them in just a little <laughs> bit, you know. I think that helps. Well, Jeff uh, said he's make he makes his own. So. Yeah, I make yeah. I make my own uh, buzz baits majority of the time. It's a it's not the what I'll call more elongated blades. Um, it's uh they're they stand up taller if you're holding looking at the buzz bait long long ways. They stand up taller, but they're narrower this way. And I'll put them back to back, a couple beads in between. So it is a double bladed buzz bait. Um, and I prefer just a um, straight white skirt. What do you think about double versus single? That debate. Um, blade. For for my style buzz bait, it's double all the way. Double but the again, way. mine is my blades are pretty different in profile than what you would normally see. Yeah. What size you throw? I mean, you throw eighth or quarter or uh, quarter? quarter? Yeah, skirt quarter ounce or soft plastic. Yeah, right? skirt, skirt, white, white skirt. That's old. That's that's mm -hmm. people don't do that tried, anymore. Yeah, that's but it's it's, it's I throw tried. I throw a toad a lot on. You throw a toad? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I had Chaz on who fishes the he fished the bass opens and he now is only seventy. He said the biggest thing is like how many docks you're fishing because he says he still throws a skirt around because he lives on the James River. He still throws a skirt most of the time, except when he goes down to the Carolinas and he's around a lot of docks. And then he switches to plastic because he said it just skips so much better to get him mm -hmm. up under those docks. Oh yeah, if you're skipping. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Color wise, mm -hmm. how important is that to adjust that with a buzz bait? Or can you just keep one color and have success? Uh, I think straight white, white or white and chartreuse. chartreuse yeah. White and chartreuse. And I like to have a black mm -hmm. one. I think mm -hmm. you take a black, a white, black. and a white chartreuse. Those three is all you'd ever need. And that covers yeah. it all. And you can use that in like, so, you know, I just cut this off my rod because I was pre fishing for the Shenandoah. This is the. Uh, this is the balling out jig head. You can buy these pretty much anywhere online, but it's perfect for a power Ned rig. Uh, this is a half ounce, but I have a three eighths and they go even smaller. But the point is you can fish a Ned rig on 14 pound test and throw it like a jig. But I was using a, you know, a June bug color Ned rig in gin clear water. I don't know why it makes no sense, but that darker color on the Shenandoah works. And I think it's the same thing with that. Like it mimics something that they're eating. And I think it's weird because again, Bassmaster tells you clear water has to be a clear bait or mm. like more natural, but that is natural to whatever they're eating down there. Yeah, Mad Toms or something. It probably looks like a Helgramite. Huh? Or yeah, yeah, a Helgramite. Right. Let's see that. Oop. That did not <laughs> slide. And that's yeah, falling out jig head. Uh, let's see. That's a good one. Let's keep scrolling. We got there. And guys, please hit that like button. It really helps us out in the algorithm. Let's see. Perfect. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, we got we got Chris in the house. Uh, what type of retrieve do you use normally? Let's say uh, for summer bass on the DOA. And I'm assuming crankbait. So does everyone want to go with that? Mm -hmm. I'll go first. Um, I had a, a mentor in high school fishing and he said like, you need to be medicated because you just don't let the water, the, the, the bait hit the water. And he put a crankbait in my hand. He said, I want you to close your eyes and count every time it hits the ground. And he called it counting rocks. And that really conditioned me to when you throw a crankbait and they, this is more like what I do on lakes is go to the speed where you can just feel it hit every time. And I think why you do that is when it hits, it has a chance to bounce off. You don't get snagged as much. And I picture those fish are sharking it and they're right there. And this is the same thing I think with a swim bait. And when it hits, they're right there and they just run into it. I know burning works a lot, but I've just never had as much success with that as when I cast it out there and I just feel it hit every single piece of cover. I'm not trying to just blow through it, but that's kind of what's worked for me. Yeah. And I'm the same way. I mean, I, I don't burn a crankbait. I nah. pretty much let them, you know, do what they want to do. Let you know, bump in the bottom and, um, they just 
you know, I think, I don't know, like Thomas said, they just come up and, I mean, when it floats, bumps the bottom and it floats back up, I think that's when they hit it, when it's not, you know, going side to side yeah. or whatever, mm-hmm. I just think they, when it floats back up, they're right there to, ready to ambush it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? And I will, uh, especially on the DOA, um, I will take these smaller crankbaits and once I hit bottom, and like you say, it's almost like you're counting rocks and you slow it, you get it down and then slow it down. Especially with this color right here, and it's proven this thing's wore out. I will actually stop this crankbait. When it starts making contact, I'll pause it. Mm. Just like pausing a jerk bait. And then I'll start it again. I like that. And numerous times you will get that reaction bite just from that pause. When you start it again, they're on it. That's so cool. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think it's, I'll definitely like to stay in contact with the bottom. But I don't think, you know, I think I think just bumping it is, is the best. I mean, I think, you know, if you get in there, you got something like this and you're just dredging the bottom, that's not natural. I mean, you know, if you're just digging a ditch, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that's not gonna be, yeah. you know, that natural. So I think you gotta, you know, keep it as natural as you can. And I think just like you're talking about, just, you know, bumping, bumping that bottom, staying in contact with it is, is the way to go. And you know, I mean, when it's on the bottom, you, most time you're going to be bringing up grass mm-hmm. or whatever, yeah, some kind of trash. And if you do yeah. slow it down a little bit, like Jeff said, I mean, when it bumps and comes up a little bit, floats. I uh, think that's important too. It's, yeah. it's just like, uh, I think the erratic, a lot of times that'll be the difference in you catching the fish or getting a bite or not. And that would be, you know, using erratic, you know, Mm-hmm. Wind it fast, just a couple minutes, and let it pause, and you know. And I mean, you got to try different things, yeah, you know. You, fit, burn, the, you know, if you do want to burn it, let the fish burn tell it. You. Let the if fish you want to slow you. it down, all right. Yeah, you, you just know. want a gift card, uh, Brian Peeler. You just want a gift card. To, I'll buy you a beer. Does Jared have a preferred routine to keep his hands so pre- presentable, or is it just fish line? <laughs> <laughs> He's a hand model. Yeah, uh, Brian, you want us, I don't know what I can give you, but you just, you just want like a shark. <laughs> oh, look at it. <laughs> this is his backup career. It's our Vanna. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but, yeah, Chris, I think that's – I'm glad you said the Shenandoah because it depends on where you're at. I mean, I like worm in a crankbait, too, if I'm on, like, a muddy bottom lake or something like that where you just – you feel it and you just pull a little bit and stop, pull a little bit and stop, but – if you're on like a rock thing where it's just you're just hitting something every time, I won't do that as much. I'm worried that I'm gonna I'm gonna actually like run it into something and snag. So I like to be a little bit more like more low and slow, versus grass where my thing with grass is as soon as I feel something, I'm giving it some kind of action to pop it free. Yep. So it really depends on where you are. And then this is important too. I just came. I was doing a crankbait today, and the guys that were out with me said like I look like I'm really burning it fast. I wasn't. It was I was fishing upstream. And I had to crank as fast as I could to keep up with the current. So that's kind of important too, is to know like the situation. You might actually look like it's you're burning it, yeah. but if you're yucking it upstream and it's ripping, you're just trying to keep up with that bait as it yep. goes down. Because if you're not, it's pretty well just yeah. Yeah. just under the surface. I yeah. mean, you got to yeah. keep it. And, and you know, another thing we hadn't really talked about, that's wood. I mean, yeah. think about a square bill through the wood. I mm-hmm. mean, that's, that's sometimes, that's money. I mean, you know, and of course coming through the wood, you, you feel it, you hit, you yep. pause it, let it rise up a little bit. And that, yeah. you, know, you, and you know, you're going to lose, you're going to lose some crankbaits, but you know, I mean, I, th- I think you can't, can't really be afraid to throw it into thick. Well, that's, I mean, that's it. What, I mean, know, like you Susquehanna, gotta, you got so many grass beds up there, you just gotta, you gotta throw I mean, it you gotta throw sometimes. it. I mean, you know, you're going to lose some, but I mean, sometimes yeah, exactly. you, you get it. But that, you kind of like, you know, everybody knows Susquehanna, you know, like all, most of two, three, four foot, but get it. If you throw into to the grass bed, or you can see them, you know, that's a whole yeah. lot easier. But when they're under the water, that's when they're hard to see. But you just uh, use your rod tip. I mm-hmm. mean, keep your rod up and slow it down. I mean. And know your setup too. I mean, if I'm, yeah, throwing, exactly. if I'm throwing my Lake Kevin Van Dam setup with a slow reel, 12 pound test, getting it down deep, you're not going to just be loading up into everything you feel because no. you're going to bog those hooks into everything. And that's why if you got, if you've seen the Bassmasters or the, or Kevin Van Dam, he almost has this weird pause before he leans into him because he broke free from something, but he's not setting the hook into it because if he did, he'd lose his bait. So yeah. he's let, he's letting that thing react first and feeling to see if it's there before he loads up. If you're fishing something on 15 pound or like straight braid, you can be a little bit more 
aggressive with your stuff because mm -hmm. I don't lose these like on the title because I'm fishing such heavy stuff. I'll just bend the hook out and I'll get the bait back. I can't do that if I'm throwing my super light like popcorn setup with 10 pound test fluorocarbon. You gotta be a little bit more ginger with it. So yeah. you know, know your stuff. I think right. Jeff brought up a good point and that's something I've, I've, I learned from him uh, fishing up on Susquehanna. He really, you, you really use your rod in crankbait fishing. And that's where, you know, yeah, I find myself not really doing that. You know, it's more, you know, just like well, yeah, and, and you got to stay and focused. Said, man, I mean, rod up. You're, right. you're, you know, you're going, you're going too deep or whatever. Mm -hmm. Get that rod tip up. Keep it, you know, keep it up. And and he does that. And that's why, you know, like I said, he'd be, he'd be, you know, catching them left and right. And here I'm fishing pretty much the same thing right there beside him. But he knows how to use. You know, he was using that rod. And that's something I've picked up on. People don't necessarily think about. You know, if you don't really fish a lot of crank bait. The, the rod know, is so important. Stuff. Like yeah. you gotta let the rod do the work for you. Um, yeah. No, I 100 percent agree with that. Uh, no, that's your friend right there. Kate. Is that Katie? Katie. Friend? She's Katie asking friend. what. What does it say? Here we go. List? Yeah. What is your right. favorite? What Katie. is a bucket? Where yeah. is a bucket list fishing location for each of you? Oh. I, I think you've already probably fished them all, you, right? I know where well, you're at. You know, my bucket list place is. Uh, I would like to go up in Michigan and do some fishing. A, you know, a place I've never been. I'm talking Small about, you know, somewhere I've never been. I would like to go up uh, and, and fish up in, in Michigan. Uh, some more, uh, what is the, what's the bay up there? The uh, Sturgeon Bay. Sturgeon Bay. Mm -hmm. some, I like That'd to go up cool. there sometimes just to, you know, or go up to Canada and fish uh, some of those big smallmouth lakes. Like up Rainy there. Lake and all those yeah, places. Yeah, that, that'd be fun. Uh, I mean, I'd, like to, I'd like to do that sometime. Uh, mm hmm. Where do you think mine's at? Well, I was thinking Erie, but I mean, I liked, uh, I mean, you know, Erie and Ontario, which, you know, we fish, but yeah. um, I'd like to try like Thousand Islands. Yeah. Area. I mean, I, yeah, I fished the St. Lawrence one time, but I had a bad yeah. experience. We had a lot of wind, but I'm definitely going back. I want to get yeah. back up there. That's, that's a yeah, place that's, that's on my list. Yeah. For some quality fish. I've always wanted to fish Lake Havasu because I want to fish in a desert and to just be able to get out there and also fish Clear Lake. I just, that place has, has always had giants. It's more of like a historical thing. It's not as good now, but just to be there would be kind of cool. Um, if I wasn't afraid I was going to get shot by a drug cartel, Lake Falcon is apparently still pumping out 10, 15 pounders. It's on the Mexican, Calif Mexican, Texas border. Why Mexican, California, <laughs> Mexican, Texas border. That would be a really cool place. Smallmouth wise, um, probably Mille Lacs, honestly, up in Minnesota. That yeah. would be a lot of, I would love actually just to go to Minnesota and just pick a lake, mm. like not even know where. Yeah, I, don't so think, many, I don't think you'd go wrong. Yeah, there. like get a hotel for a week and every and day hit Every a day hit lake. a different Yeah, lake. that would be. That, that'd be that'd fun. Be great. Yeah. yeah. I, I'd love to. That's, that's um, definitely a bucket list. Yeah, because exploring new places is just, is is so fun to me. Um, and have you ever experienced a place that you went, like when you went down to Tennessee, like you just go somewhere else, like, oh, I'm going to go to, you know, Cayuga or whatever, but then it's like, I'm going to actually pull over and go here. Well, kind of. I mean, I've, you know, I've been, you know, fishing Kentucky Lake and say, well, you know, I think I'm going to go down to Pickwick or go up to Wheeler, you know, uh, Jeff, I mean, Jeff was down at uh, what? Well, South uh, Holston. Uh, South Holston and Watauga. Watauga, too. You know, those are great lakes. I'd love to go back down there some South I mean, Holston and the Virginia and Tennessee Yeah. yeah. And really? Mm -hmm. Lake Watauga. Yeah, I got a cousin that, that is. Watauga's awesome. Yeah, lake. Watauga's in the mountains. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful clear lake. reservoir. And, hmm. you know, there's some big smallmouth in there. Yes, there is. Yeah, and, and just big beautiful, mouth. beautiful territory. But, but we're night fishing. In the mountains. Uh, the black light. In the mountains. and Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I've done, done some of that where I, you know, just kind of bounce around some, but it's, uh, I don't, you know, I don't get, I hope to do more of that coming up, but I mean, you know, cause work, I don't get to, you know, I have to kind of be, pick and choose when mm -hmm. I can do things now, but. We need a change. countdown clock for when you retire. We'll just That's keep right. that at Jake's with That's every right. day we'll ticking down. It's counting down now. It's <laughs> counting down, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, I love fishing. I'm just like all y'all, you know. And yeah. I think fishing new places. I see fun. that one guy grew up fishing. At new River. I want to back to Saint the New Claire. River. I can't wait to get back down the New River. Jake, uh, Jared and I was talking about going down there and camping for a couple nights and fishing New River. 
different. Yeah, I want to do that. Um, and I'm actually blessed. Huge shout out to Trey at Innovate Sportsman. He got me up with a Torquedo. I think it's a, a four. It's the smaller version, guys. I'm terrible with acronyms. And that really opened my eyes to like all the places I want to explore now. Uh, Kanaka Jig Creek, Antietam, Monocacy, just places like you probably don't want to put a jet boat always, but you can just throw a ki- like sneak a kayak in there. Um, and also going past Paw Paw on the upper Potomac and places like there's just so many cool little places around here that are sneaky that you could probably catch some really cool sized fish. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and with so many your, with like your that. kayak, with a motor now that you can, you know, you're not. Yeah. You can just beat go. Beat yourself to death trying to keep, you know paddling and keeping oh my goodness my uh, calves were cramping i and I, I, t- I told jared like i had to go across pohick bay when i was doing the the last tournament but i was pedaling and i'm not lance armstrong and i was i was dying and so this was a blessing to get a motor where i can just be fat and lazy finally uh ooh, lake winnipeg okay we've got brandon henry here lake winnipesaki i have heard of that place but i've never fished it before that's interesting huh I said that would be a blast. We got Katie said that like that would be a blast, and we got um, uh, uh, a Holvi, Holvi in Texas. Jared, is that what is that word? Texas has big bass, so. Not just me. Uh, fishing in the desert would be sick, especially they also have world record sunfish there at Lake Havasu that are over I think they're 15 pounds. Wow, the, the bluegill. They're <laughs> they're massive. Um, I'm actually gonna pull that picture up because that's really really cool. Uh. Here we go. Ooh, wrong one. What is everyone's favorite place to fish? Mm. Uh, Doc, you go first. Well, that's a hard one, really. Uh, I love fishing Susquehanna River, but that's obviously not local. I love fishing Shenandoah River, so... If you're talking about local to Winchester, I think, you know, I'm, of course, Shenandoah River guy. If you're talking about away from here, I love I'm, Susquehanna River. I just love fishing. It's a beautiful river. It's, uh, I just, I just like the, the scenery of the river. You know, it's a great fishery. Um, so yeah, I'd have full to say. Full of fish. I mean, there's a yeah, lot of, a lot of good fish lot there. Of, here we go. Fish. I'll pull this up for you. Uh, so I, you know, that's where I like. That's Lake Havasu. Hmm. That'd be fun on a four pound line. <laughs> no. No. Like I would just look. Might like, fit on a black stone. Yeah. <laughs> I bet when those things turn broadside to you in 15 Oh my gosh. Water, yeah. Like that would just be Mm-mm-mm. absolutely a blast. So yeah, that's a bucket list fish. It's not just bass I want to catch. There are a lot of bucket list fish I actually want to get. Um, mm-hmm. I want to catch a tarpon on light line. That's a big one. I also, Travis Eden said eventually he's going to get me on a fly on a carp. I want to see if I can actually get one of those because apparently it's harder than a bonefish to do without a bow. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff, what's your... Uh, hmm? Yeah, what's your favorite? Uh, um, local is Shenandoah. Um, anything, you know, driving four hours or more, I'll say, um, is definitely a Lake Erie. Ooh. Yeah, it's quality, quantity, and I'm talking smallmouth. Hands down for me is um, definitely Lake Erie. And then, you know, with Ontario being just up the road. But, and you're going to, you're going to pick places where you've got confidence and you've had great success in the past is what it boils down to. And me for Lake Erie, you know, we've been going up there for a few years now. You learn something every time you go. You find, you know, new rock piles or ledges or, you know, this bait works great over here, but not over here. It's all that. So we've got, uh, I would say we've got Lake Erie area, oh, you got some sections. Tuned in. We've got that tuned in where it's, so cool. it becomes um, almost too easy. Mm. And, and, that, and that's your, that's your confidence yeah. level going in. If you don't mm-hmm. have that confidence level, you know, um, a lot of times you'll struggle. Yeah. And but, I think with the warm yeah. winters now, I mean, look how much warmer it was. And it's in the bites for, earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just look at the fishing trips we just come off of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, speaking yeah. Speaking up there. I mean, oh, yeah. You know, we, you know, we were up there, what, second week of second April? April. April. And um, Third week normally week. we would go the second week of May. May. So yeah. it's a and month you know, earlier. We, we all had great trips. I mean, um, we caught a bunch of big fish. And uh, But you learn, you learn over the years how to gauge when it's go time. Mm-hmm. I go by water temperature. Yeah. I mean, to me, when it's 
I'm going to say 42, maybe even 40. Yeah. I mean, I think those big girls come in first. I'm going to say 40 degrees. Mm-hmm. You know, and what I've had this year going up north on Lake Ontario, I think if it's another mild winter, I'm going to go to first week of April because I you know might not catch mm-hmm. – 30, 40 fish. But it's quality. But you're gonna, you may have it's a chance quality. to catch. I mean, my biggest up there is right at seven pounds. Mm-hmm. And, you know, believe me, you got to go where they live. And when yeah. you do that, you got a chance to catch the biggest. That's like the last couple of trips to Erie we just took. Yep. You had a seven. I had a seven one. Seven Erie. one. I had a six fifteen. And we had another, I had another six six. And yeah. I said we had a six eight. Just a numerous six, five pound fish. Yeah. It, I mean, seven. it's, yeah. Big fish. I mean, that time, you yeah. know, barrel. Uh, but it's that confidence level and you know once mm-hmm. you learn that body of water you just bounce from waypoint to waypoint <laughs> yeah. to waypoint. my I mean, screen that... is my screen is covered with waypoints <laughs> that's so much covered fun, with waypoints so yeah. if you want to book a trip with them to go up to erie uh let's see all right oh scrolling up there okay here we go we talking crappie again? No, John. We are talking. Well, actually, we're talking about the shell crackers at Lake Havasu. Um, they're just absolutely mad. Actually, I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't even share my screen with you. So we're just looking at a photo and laughing. My apologies. Here, let, me, <laughs> let me share that screen real quick. Come on. Uh, entire screen. There we go. So I was showing like my dream is like Lake Havasu in Arizona. And one thing is like, I want to catch some of these shell crackers. They're just sunfish, but they're just I, steroids i think they don't look real but yeah. they catch them on four pound tests mm-hmm. look like absolute blast uh so that's what we're talking about like those things look like i don't know i would enjoy catching at least one of them just to say that i did uh let's see he it's oh here we go uh we got scott again uh why do you think crankbaits so important in the post spawn i would think a stressed fish would prefer a jig I think it's because they're trying to feed. Yeah, uh, I, it's think also, it's, I think it's the feed up after, you know, if you go through that initial shock of the. Yeah, they're just know, trying to eat of, everything they can see. They just get you know, real hungry again. And you can cover resting. the water. I mean, you cover so much water with a crankbait. This is, this is, if this is dumbing down fishing, real, real one on one stuff here. Do you go one hook or you go trebs? And really, any decision you go in fishing is these two because there's no other real hook that's out there is a treble hook or one hook. The problem with one hook here is you're going to get a lot of fish that'll push or slap at a bait. You're not going to get them with this. A fish that pushes or slaps at a tread bait, you have a higher percent chance of actually getting them. So I really think it comes down to when they're not feeding good, I want to throw something that has trebs because I have a higher chance of getting them to commit. So when it's super cold, uh, like pre-spawn, bluebird days i'm gonna go with a jerk bait a crank bait, something like that because they might not want to eat and this comes by and they just flail their gills at it to get it out of their face you can catch them with this if they do that to a chatter bait or a swim jig you're not gonna get them and i know that for a fact i'm not gonna pull that rod out but when i throw my swim jigs i did an hour seminar on this when they take the rod out of your hand with a swim jig they're not hitting it well they're just ramming it when they knock slack into your line, that's when the swim jig bite is on because they're coming up behind it and inhaling it. So if I feel that they're smacking it hard, that means they're not taking the bait well. They're, they like it, but they're not, they don't like it enough to open their mouth to it. So you go to something with travel hooks because if they want to smack at this thing, they're going to get a lot of metal in their face. I think that's one, I don't know, brain theory with all that stuff. Um, let's see. JJ Spicer, Prototype Lure Company. Oh, Jeffrey David Spicer. Pro- I get it now. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. Uh, oh, V. She's pronouncing that Lake and Texas. Oh, thank I. You know who you're talking to, right? I can't pronounce English at all. Uh, Murray River. That's a good one. Let's see. We got Go H two O. Who? Hello from Cal, dude. There we go. Some of the Docs fans are everywhere. We're gonna get some people coming in from Europe here soon. Uh, I'll be fishing for carp on fly this summer. Should be a doozy. I've I've heard that it's a lot of fun. They're just they're like trash bone fish. Aren't the cicadas supposed to come out? Yeah. Yes. And they they, will they inhale oh, yeah, they those do. cicadas. I mean, uh, one of these tournaments, uh, I heard that they were Murray. I think, yeah, I think yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah, it Murray. Was it Murray? Cicadas. I don't know. I think it was one before that one. But you know, it's from Pasadena. Oh yeah, Logan. 
can y'all so break can can Thank y'all you, break down different line setups for different cranks braid to leader mono oh my god all right who wants to go first well, i'm straight mono i mean mm. i keep it simple uh like say 10 pound test on my bait casters and i mean that's what i throw the crank bait on i don't even go to eight eights on my spinning rods and you know that's me yeah again i'm throwing 10 on a bait caster six on a on a uh, spinner rod and that's for local waters um you know if i'm like you on the lower potomac um and yeah. you're in some heavy grass then yeah the braid really comes into play and it's the size of fish i mean mm -hmm. to be fair for the shando and the upper potomac there's not a lot of five and sevens and i'm pretty sure would you throw six pound test up at lake erie for for your crankbait setups oh still? yeah all really? the time wow you are a brave man my god <laughs> yes. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> all all the time <laughs> oh my all god the time. Uh, um i have multiple jumbo spools i don't even think they make it anymore um it's called sigma it's sigma from still thing. way back huh yeah i think i think yeah. shakespeare used to make it but i just have this everything from four pound to i think it's 20 or 25 pound just boxes and boxes of jumbo spools um and that's that's the only mono that i throw yeah yeah um so again since i'm on the spectrum of this stuff the longer your cast is one variable to where if you're hooking them at the very end of the cast i think going with braid or a braid to leader works i know um jeff little and jake harshman like going braid to fluoro when they're fishing the susky just because they're in a kayak they fish fluorocarbon but when they set the hook on them their kayaks scoot forward so they like to have that zero stretch to make sure they bury the trebs if you're not out of a kayak everything they said works out great what i've seen with the kayak is you want less stretch when you're fishing that because i saw this in lake anna i had a five and a half pound large mouth and it was my old setup and i i did this and my kayak just i felt it scoot forward on it it came straight up and it spit so you need to be able to get more force into that hook to make sure you get it buried and you don't lock up and this is where i think gopros are good you don't have to be a content creator to watch playback of how you are but i can tell on a boat where i do this and i i hold it for a second and i take a step back with my hips i can't do that in a kayak i'm just doing this and i'm just holding it like i'm holding a tug toy with a dog i had to break myself of that habit then when i'm in a kayak and i feel a fish don't do this but just start cranking to gain up the slack especially on the Shenandoah when you're fishing up river, you can't take a step back. You can't do anything. And so you have to get on that handle and catch up with them because nine times out of 10, it feels like those suckers come down, yeah. down at you and you got nothing to do, but do, Oh, and if you are anchored, um, it's a little bit easier. If you have a motor and you're kayaking, turn the motor off. So you drift backwards so you can help get some of that slack, but don't keep going up current because they're, I think they usually are going straight down um let's see beautiful i struggle with let me see let me see uh i struggle with some of the names of the places and some of those last names yeah some of these th these places are not good for people like me who can't speak english uh let's see fishing world uh it's amazing your video is very good uh you are successful look at here brian peeler we probably won't see any uh, periodical cicadas around here but that doesn't mean the fish won't engage them when they present with options yeah i am I know there are some parts of Virginia are supposed to get it pretty hot and heavy, but not all parts of Virginia are going to get them hot and heavy. Um, I think, I think we finally, did we get caught up on all of our chats? That's amazing. Um, let's see. Y'all think of the crank bit? Ooh, here we go. Here's a couple I saved from earlier. Everett, I think you already want a gift card, but if not, you also want another gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Uh, let's see. Do you all like to use bigger crankbaits or smaller ones? I don't even think we talked about like in general for, let's say the Shenandoah up in Potomac. What sizes do you all like to use? Oh, small to medium. Small to medium. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Like I said, uh, yeah, majority of the time, throwing something like a 1.5, that size, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a 2.5. And and going maybe smaller, too. That size. Mm -hmm. Helps a lot. Like, And what's nice is because BFS caught on, it really helps us creak and smallmouth anglers out because you're getting crankbaits that are tinier with longer bills. It, I remember when it's like to get a crankbait with any depth, the bait was massive. And now I feel like you can get some really compact baits, but they'll still get pretty deep, which oh, is yeah. really nice. 
Um, and I need to try out some of those, Doc, that you had, because those, those look really, really, really good. Uh, let's see, we did that one. Ooh, Ray Dalton. Uh, just fish a Nico Helgramite or a tube for clear water. And when water rises or strained, use a spinnerbait or chatterbait. Also, top wire popper, all you need, game over. I, you know, you say that, but I've done extremely well with the crankbait. And again, you know, I also said, like, I smoke them with a swim jig too, which if you've listened to that seminar I did, it's basically a skirted swim bait. That's how you fish these things. It's just like a swim bait. You just slowly reel it. And when it pops free, it, you're going to get, you're going to get trucked with that. Um, let's see, that's the BSF crankbait. I think that's, I think that's, I think that is everything. I cannot believe we got through everything so quickly. Uh, no, Scott's not done with us yet. Scott, uh, let's talk speed of reels. Um, I'm doing too much talking. How about mm. you three go? <laughs> what speed you like for crank for crank beats? You know, I typically use a seven, uh, you know, seven, seven, three, one. seven one or yeah. seven whatever, whatever, depending on the brand reel you're using. Uh, majority of the time, I mean, I think you know at least that one you can slow it down. Uh, where if you're using a five or you know something like that, you. Uh, that's just my preference. I mean, some people say, you know, like using five because, you know, it, it keeps them slow. Mm -hmm. And I, I grant it. So, and some people have a hard time keeping a, a faster speed reel. You know, when you mm -hmm. need to fish it slow, they, it's a little mm -hmm. more trouble. But at least you got a little more, uh, you know, uh, capability if you're using faster. To me, a faster reel and, and slowing it down than a slower reel trying to come down the river, like you said, mm -hmm. you know. Yes, that's that's just my opinion. I, that, that's Pick it my extra line. That's, mm -hmm. It's it's so it it depends. I think is the is the answer. Like, give us a scenario because I really is it a cold front where I need to slow down because I got ADHD and I can't slow down a seven point. My body won't let me. So I'll give myself a cute little four point nine. I can just crank on that all day, but it's still scooting. That's just me. But then also, you know, I have a seven plus on here because today on the Shenandoah, that thing was ripping and I just, I had to keep up with it. So yeah, it, it, it depends on so many things scenario wise. Are you throwing a freaking, you know, shovel? Well, if you throw that thing on a nine, you're going to be real tired. Like you probably want something with a lower gear ratio. So, mm -hmm. you know, it really depends. And that's what's so cool about the crankbase. You can vary that stuff up to mm -hmm. where you can make these things rip and burn, or you can slow them down, or you can jerk them. Um, you can do a lot of things with them and they're really, really versatile and people don't fish them enough. They really don't. And it's hard because I had a conversation with my friend about that. Now that you got swim baits, because I remember swimming a grub on the river and now no one swims grubs. It's a little bit of, you know, kitex and stuff. And now you got the chatter baits and spinner baits and swim baits. And it, it's almost like you only have so many rods and two hands. Like, what do you pick to throw? And I feel like when that happens, you have baits that just fall out of. Remember, like the spinner bait, like dropped off for a couple of years on the pros. And then all of a sudden it came back. Like, yeah. it's just, I don't know. I feel like things go in cycles. You know, an interesting thing about the speed of a reel, too. I mean, and, and I'm sure y'all have all had it. You, you 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 get a fish, you get a fish on, and you know, there are things coming toward towards you, mm -hmm. coming toward the boat. And I remember just this last trip. I mean, I, I said, you know, yeah, I got a fish. It didn't feel like it was going to be very big. Then thing gets at the boat. Then you look, and it's darn, it's a it's a monster, and then suddenly he he's gone the other way. So I think you know that that's uh, that's where you know. Yeah, no two. I mean, talking about smallmouth, no two are the same. Yeah. I mean, it's they're just. I mean, I you know I've said it before. They're just a fish with an attitude, and it is just. A, I love catching them. I mean, there's Absolutely. no other fish. I mean. Really, I don't care if I ever catch a largemouth again. Yeah. I really don't. I mean, the smallmouth is, I've told it before, you know, and these veins are smallmouth swimming. I mean, I bleed smallmouth, and uh, it's just a fish that I go to bed thinking about them, I wake up thinking about them. Yeah, I love, love you know. smallmouth fish. Well, let, let's finish off on this right here. Um, well, let's answer this one more question before I have this closing thought. This is a good one. Here we got... Uh, and I'm not going to pronounce your name, and I apologize. I have something wrong with me. Uh, B. Callis Jr. B. Callis. 
I think. Uh, how often do you use a tube bait and what conditions make it a better choice? That's our last question of the night. Well, I'm, I'm a tube bait. I mean, I'm <laughs> a tube bait person. I mean, I fish tubes more than I fish just about anything else. And that's a year round. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's you, if I had one bait, I had to pick to know I could only have one bait to go out to lat for the whole year it would be a tube and it would be it would be a jw custom tube <laughs> and that's all I, if i could have one bait and one what conditions make it better though huh are there better conditions for the tube or are there days that it'll work better and what would that be uh i mean i I think it's to a me, conf it's confidence a, thing. I mean, yeah, it's just it conf pretty much it's more down confidence to it. than it is the, to me the weather. And that's just that. That's a that's my confidence bait is the tube, and I'll you know I fish it in you know lakes, rivers, wherever, uh, large mouth or small mouth. I mean, I'll and I've just got a lot of I fish it from you know Alabama to Canada. I mean, wow. I mean it's it's. Uh, it's, a, it's to me it's, just, it's my go-to bait it's weird because i've i've been blessed where i've gotten to talk to one or two people and the tube versus ned rig is like cowboys versus redskins it's hard to find somebody that loves those baits equally it's you either love the tube or ned rig more you do have exceptions but it, it they're cult following for those two baits it really is yeah. what, what um tube for me january february march and april then my game, my whole game changes um, through the warmer months. Hmm. Um, then I'll pick it back up again November, December. Unless during those warmer months we get rain, water rises, get some color to it, then I'm back on a tube or jig. Hmm. Yep. You know, if I'm if I'm hitting that bank, you know, and the water's <laughs> coming up and it's it's right, then I'm hitting the pitching the hitting tube or, or pitching the jig in. But once that water comes back down and gets more clarity to it, yeah. um, then my whole game yeah, switches. switches. I'm pretty much the same way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I throw the bigger uh, yeah. So the only exception I have is I won a lot of money on Thursday nighters up on the upper Potomac. Uh on this thing right here. Where'd it go? This is the bitsy trd yep um and this is in like july hottest part of the day i go with a i think it's a almost an eight foot rod by uh phoenix it's a medium medium light action eight foot's a salmon rod basically but um that's a rod that i've used before and you can just chuck this a mile and for some reason that that super small profile when it's hot as hell it I don't know why, but I just outfished people that were throwing tubes and, and normal size Ned rigs. But besides mm -hmm. that, yeah, I, I'm pretty much a, I'm a Ned rig guy more than a tube guy. And I think it's because I can take that and I feel more confident with that setup. But my bucket list item, sort of speak, is to get more into tubes because Antietam Bassmasters, there's a lot of guys that throw tubes and just kick my ass all the time with it. So I really need to get the confidence with throwing the tube more and getting the bite. But we can't fish every bait. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. I think that's a good. I think that's got everything there. So yeah, closing thoughts uh, for everybody. Um, where do you think the next state record is going to come from, smallmouth wise, in Virginia? If you had to guess. Hmm. But right now it's New River, right? Probably it's yeah, New eight River. Pound, I think right it's eight now. pound, one and a half ounce. Yeah, and I, you know, I think one thing about the New River is. I, you might not catch as many fish, but I think you got bigger fish uh, down there. Um, I don't know. I'd like to. I'd like to say it's going to come from somewhere up in here, but I don't. You know. Uh, then you got, like I said, you got South Austin Lake places down there in the lower yeah. part of the state. You got some big old smallmouth. Uh, I don't much feel like it's going to come out of a river though. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt yeah, it. Yeah, I think out of a river more than a lake. Well, I know down south, like Holston and them places, they're they're pounded by tournaments. Yeah. I mean, that's Smith Mountain. I think Smith could have one. I think Smith could have one. I think um, Conowingo could have one lurking in there. I think where's that other place? I think Moo Mall might have one because that place has a lot of trout. Oh, yeah. And nice. if you get some smallmouth that are trout eaters, like those things, I think that one old new river record 
way back when was in a trout portion, uh, a really trouty area of the new. And I, that could work out too. Upper Potomac, I think it's going to crank out a, a high seven or an eight right now because it's just fishing so freaking good past the Brunswick area. I don't think it's going to get eight plus nine, but I think that seven to eight range definitely. That's a hell of a small mouth. Well, the, That's the, a hell of a small The state mouth. record for West Virginia is is out of the upper Potomac, yeah. and it's 9.75. Yeah. That is a powerful. That's a hell of a I mean, you fish. ain't talking far off the world record. No. You know? No. But, yeah, the, the upper Potomac, man, is just, there's some monster small mouth. It's really on right now. It, it is, is on. Now, are you talking about above Brunswick or? Below? So, right now, it seems like it's Harper's Ferry down towards uh, the Monocacy seems to be like on fire right now. Lander? Lander's, Lander? down, Lander's down the next ramp below yeah. Brunswick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just, down. it's yeah. for some reason right now it's right on fire. Point of Rocks. Point of Rocks. Yeah. Jeff said he, at uh, New River, yeah. And Jeff, uh, Jeff Green said he's seen one, he caught one he showed me that was, it went six and a half easily. And so, I'm under the impression that you never catch the biggest. So, if there's a six and a half that you boated that means there's probably a seven swimming. So I don't know, like if those fish are healthy, they probably have a couple more years of life that they can gain some weight. So I'm thinking we could see a seven. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the Potomac's time to shine. I think this is its cycle. And I think the Shenandoah, you know, knock on wood, we don't have any major fish kills. I think the Shenandoah will be there in what, three years, four years. Yeah. You'll start seeing those that weight. Yeah. So guys, um, you know, we've been here almost two hours. It's midnight basically where we're at. Or feels like it, even though it's ten. <laughs> I've I've been on the water all day. I'm tired from fishing. Um, yeah, Doc, do you got anything else you want to add? No, I just want Thomas. Want to thank you for coming down to Jake's uh, tonight live with the with the show, fishing the DMV. I, I love the show. It's always a uh, pleasure when uh, Turkey's a cow. You, they call him. Invite, invite, invite me on, and uh, just want to thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Thanks, thank Jake's bait and tackle for putting this up and you know uh, allowing just to be here tonight and uh and most of all thank thank you to our uh, viewers uh, thank you all for tuning in and all the wonderful questions and this is just always great to get together and talk fishing yeah it is and guys we will be back here shortly probably uh probably in a month we'll be back here in june to give you like this hot water things and we will probably have to have a top water bait show honestly we'll be into top water season which is always an absolute blast uh we'll keep you posted on how the tournaments go this weekend as always please if you could like subscribe to the channel it really helps out the algorithm also go check us out on patreon if it wasn't really for patreon i couldn't be pumping out four to five episodes a week like a madman it really it's it's amazing that we've had so many people join patreon please check it out if you want to we're 15 away from our next major milestone and we will see you next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will